Hey, welcome back to the Gwanda Assembly of God YouTube channel for another sermon. This is sermon number two in a series called What's It Gonna Take? Hope it's encouraging and challenging to you. And if you'd like to contact the church or myself directly, uh, look for us on Facebook by searching Gwanda Assembly of God. We talk about the butterfly effect sometimes and how one small thing in a life, one experience, one little detail can change so many things. I was talking to somebody um, just the other night and... Uh, we got on the subject of uh, something that had happened in their life, in their family's life, where someone had been very sick. And it seemed like a really tough thing to kind of wrap your brain around, but that situation has blossomed into a lot of people's lives being touched and changed. And we were talking about how someday when we cross over that threshold into eternity, will we look back and say, man, that thing that we thought at first was so unfair has turned out to dynamically change so many lives and it was that from from the perspective of that person who went through the tragedy personally it will all have been worth it you know that's really just everything changes when this isn't all there is but one little thing involved being involved in something like this can really change the life of a student so okay this is a series the series is called what's it going to take and this is message number two of it um, I'd like to start off this morning by reading a piece of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You guys hear me say a lot of times it's about turning over the keys. It's about becoming property. I can't, you can, please do, here's the keys. The relationship we have with him is literally one where we are bought. We are helpless, hopeless, covered with sin that we can't pay for, and he purchases, purchases us out of that pit, out of that filth, and we become his. We are clean and redeemed because we're his, not because he wiped us off and sent us on our way. We are his. Amen. Okay, what's it going to take? Today I want to talk about a specific section of scripture that has one of these in it. Does anyone know what this is? I know this is not, you don't see this in Minecraft, so not everybody's going to know what this is. This is a plow. Now what they would do is hook these behind horses. Eventually we invented tractors that would pull 12 or 14 of these blades through the ground, but this is a tool used to turn the ground over. This is kind of the first thing that needs to happen in a crop being planted. You need to turn the ground over. If you just go out in a field and throw seed on the ground, you're not going to get enough to bother with. But if you turn the ground over, soften up the ground, till the ground up, now all of a sudden something can be planted in this ground. You literally create the ground, the good ground that the seed fell on and produced 10 or 30 or 100. It's the work of producing that ground. So the question is, to plow or not to plow? I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 9. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Luke chapter. If you have a phone with a Bible on it with you, turn to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. I know it's on the wall. I just, I like to read it out of this book. You know, I just, I don't know. You know, there's power in his word, and sometimes just holding this in your hand, it's a, I don't know, it hits me. Let's read 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my house. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is a really heavy portion of scripture where Jesus says some things that you kind of begin to wonder, could he possibly have actually meant that? I'll come to follow you, but let me go. Please, just let me go and bury my father first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. 
I think there's more to the story. There's more to the story. When, he, when this young man says, let me go and bury my father, this is most likely a story of tradition and custom of his time. What he's probably saying is, my father is old. Let me go and see him for, the, for finish his life and let me honor him and bury him. A lot of times there was a year-long process of a family burying and saying goodbye to a loved one. So this time of mourning, this bury my father, could have been like a year-long process that a family just went through this time of mourning, which is very healthy. But this is more than just, it's not likely that the story in this specific situation is one where this guy's father has just tied and Jesus is telling him to skip his funeral. That's not likely what the story is. It has so much more to do with tradition and um, expectations. I want to look at three things that I think this portion of scripture talks specifically about. These are three things that are reasons why not to lay down all your concerns and all that's going on in life and follow him. Now, what's interesting is the last thing he uses is an analogy to actually work, to begin to do a work, not just to follow someone off to who knows where and walk away from everything that is your life right now. This isn't a call to drop your job and your family and everything and and move off to some foreign mission field. That's not what this call is. This call is a turning of your life focus to what it is he wants to accomplish. I'm going to read through the scripture again. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I think this portion, the first of these three things, is talking about basic needs. When our lives come to a place where we say, I'm going to follow you, I've given my heart to you and you're baptized. You're saying it's no longer my life. My life goes into the grave. When it comes out, it's yours. Our whole lives, we grow up meeting our own basic needs. But you're coming into a life spot where you're saying, I'm going to trust you for everything. What I eat, what I wear, my life's call, the whole thing is now yours. I think sometimes we don't think of, we don't consider how deeply we're committing to him owning our lives, right? We're committing everything. And one of the things that we can hold on to that can become a reason why not to follow him is that I don't know if I can trust him with all that. I don't know if I can trust him with my basic needs. Let me give you a, a situation where this might be. Let's, say, let's just say someone comes to know the Lord and they're a drug dealer. Maybe God gets a hold of somebody's life who's into human trafficking. Somebody who's into just illegal activity, something that's wrong. And maybe they've never known that God hated that or that God did not want them to be in that. A person in that situation needs to literally put their very basic needs in his hands in order to turn their life to him. Many people, when they're battling addictions, this, this is a major issue. Like, I don't, they come, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Their life is out of control. To surrender to him is to let go of the very, very basic things because they know in the society they're in that, that what they're doing is not acceptable, so it obviously must not be acceptable to God. So if I turn my life over to God, that means I'm going to have to let go of my ability to not be sick, my ability to not be in pain, my ability to be in control of my emotions, to however they, that's painted in their mind. Very basic needs can be a reason why not to surrender a life, why not to let go. Let's read on. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This is traditions and expectations. Some of us have things in life where, like, if I commit to God, there are going to be traditions that I have to let go of. When I was about seven or eight years old, many of you already know this story, my dad decided one Lent season to read the Bible an hour a day instead of giving up chocolate or whatever. 
and started reading things in scripture that were telling him, like he read into Romans and the book of Ephesians and Galatians and started to realize that he was in trouble because his life had sin and he couldn't be good enough to pay for it. He began to realize that salvation was a gift, that the blood of Christ had been spent to pay for his life and that he had never been told that before. So he decided to look for a place where his family would be taught what the Bible really said. He left the church tradition and all of the expectations that his entire family had. Now my mom's side of the family reacted really bad to that because they were extremely rooted in the religious tradition that we were coming out of. And we literally lost a lot of our family for about 10 years. Is that a legitimate human reason why not to follow him? Why not to turn your life over to him? Yeah, absolutely. Expectations and traditions. Let's read on. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This one's tough. Some people will not ever consider turning their life over to Jesus because they don't want to be a church person. They don't want to disappoint their friends who they know would not approve of them being a born-again or being a Christian or being a Jesus freak or a holy roller. I've been called all those things lots of times. We don't even have any chandeliers in here to hang from and do crazy stuff. But <laughs> did somebody just, um, because that we were talking about hanging some big deer antler chandeliers in here, unless we never did that? Was that you, Marty? <laughs> I totally forgot about that. So, what was, oh my goodness. We talked a while back about hanging some big deer, shan, deer antler chandeliers in here, and a lot of the women were like, mm. somehow it passed and never happened. I'm not sure how that happened, but... But this is a legitimate human reason not to commit your life to Christ. What are my friends going to think? What are my family going to think? What will my wife think? I can imagine being in a spot, and let me tell you how I imagine this, okay? I've spent lots of time ministering to and getting to know and talking with Mormon missionaries and Mormon people who are in the Mormon faith, okay? Which is not a Christian religion. If you want to know more about it, ask me. But I, I, I just imagine, what if one night after talking to the Mormon missionaries, I came home and said to Sarah, you know, I think they might be right. I can't imagine the reaction. But you know what? That's what they face when they begin to question, is this what I've believed my whole life actually true? They face this very thing. When you're sharing your faith with someone who is a Muslim, or with someone who is a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or someone who is an atheist or someone who has grown up just believing that yeah, the God of the Bible is this cruel God who this and that and one, ties, one day is this way and one day is that way and it's just a bunch of hogwash and the church is full of hypocrites. You know, when they begin to open that door to the blood of Christ changing their life, they're going to have to answer to boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses, kids, parents, whatever, this is a legitimate reason why not to commit your life to Christ. Here's the thing, and it's not only something that affects the initial decision to follow him, but it affects every decision to surrender your life more to him. If he calls your life to focus on him more, that might mean, it actually will mean, that your focus is going to have to come off of something else. The focus of our life is him. He wants it to be him. He wants it to be him in the way that my life as a husband is focused on Sarah. Her life is focused on me. In this physical world, there is not a person that my life will be more focused on than her. I love my kids. They're going to move away. And I want to be left with her. So I need to focus on her. Amen, she needs to focus on me. Having a healthy marriage is... Easier for some than others, but it is a job. And if my focus is on me 
or all these things that I can get involved with in my world, it's going to hamper this marriage. He uses marriage as a relationship to signify his and ours because it's the best example. It is a marriage. My focus needs to be primarily on him and his is on me. He says, even, even though a mother could forget her nursing child, I can never forget you for I've written you on the palm of my hand, right? So this is very much about where is our focus. So I'm sitting at my table at home, uh, putting the PowerPoint all together, and I'm just trying to concentrate, and all of a sudden my phone starts going off. Local friend of mine, pastor of a church here in town, is doing a Bible study on Friday nights at Love, Inc. If you're looking for a Bible study midweek, awesome pastor, super message, great Bible study. It's at like 7 o'clock at Love, Inc. Have at it. He's a super guy. So he sends out a message. This is my phone. That's the phone that's somewhere in my office. So I got my laptop. I'm working at the table. The kids are running all over the place. And all of a sudden, I'm going, then it's, I'm like, oh, no. Has anyone here ever been the victim of a group text? So if you don't have a smartphone, let me explain. When I press a button that says, mess, like I get a message, or I'm going to send a message, I press a little thing, I go into where my text message is, and it's, I can click this little button and pick the recipients the message is going to go to, or the recipient the message is going to go to. If I pick more than one, I get this little block, and on the left-hand side it says, group message, and you press, if you press that button, that means that everybody who gets the message will also get all the messages everyone responds with. So if I send it to 20 people and Mindy's one of them and she says, okay, thanks, and Martina's on the list, Martina gets the okay, thanks. And everybody on the list gets the okay, thanks. So everybody on the list gets every okay, thanks that everybody on the list sends. Now if you press the button on the right which says individual messages, then you're a Christian. (laughs) That means you're saved. Okay? That means everybody will get your message, but if they respond... Everybody else won't get that message, just I will. Now, I am guilty of the group message. When I first started texting people here and there in the church body, I, the first one I sent out was a group message, and it did not go well. I just forgot. I forgot, but I repented. I did. I got rebaptized, and I pressed the individual message button. Now, why is this such a huge deal? Here's part of why. One does not simply leave a group text message. Okay? So when you send a group text message, everybody is in jail until the last person stops responding to the message. This is only applicable and useful if everybody needs to know what everyone else thinks, which is never. Okay, what, is, what on earth does this have to do with he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is unfit for the kingdom? If I were a farmer and all I had were those plows and horses and I needed people to plow the fields, I would look for young, strong people without cell phones. Okay, because when you plow a field, you need it to be straight because if it's not straight, you end up with ruts all over the place that are unusable and you just waste space on the field and it just creates nightmares, okay? When there's a job to do, no matter what the job is, you need people who can focus on that job and do that job. A group text for me was so distracting, I just, and then, and then people start having fun with it. Hi everybody, send. I love group texting, send. And I think they're like messing with the guy who sent it. But I'm getting every message. So can I do my work? No. I could take my phone and put it somewhere else, but everybody knows that you can't do that because you'll die if you don't keep your (laughs) smartphone within arm's reach. I mean, the world could implode and you wouldn't know. So you have to keep it there. Huge distraction. No matter what you're doing, the thing you hate about a group message is Every time that thing goes off, you have to look. 
you know, like fear of missing out or whatever it is. You have to look. And then you're delete, 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 delete. And, and you're, you're just fighting yourself not to be like, will all you morons please stop? <laughs> you know, the only thing you could do is identify every message and block them from your contacts list. But by the time you get that done, they've all stopped. It's going to take you like a day to do that. Um, the part that's so annoying is that it takes all of your attention away from what it is you are trying to accomplish. It's a huge distraction. Now, just yesterday, we had something really cool happen, and I've been wanting to tell you guys more about this um, for a while. I was uh, down here in town, and I got a message from Paula Woronski. Uh, Paul and Dave are members here at the church, and they also raise seeing eye dogs. They've been doing this for a number of years. And um, one of the things that they do when they're training these dogs is they'll begin to take them into uh, places with more and more people and more activity and more traffic to teach them to remain focused and to ignore distractions, right? And so I had been talking to Paula for a while about, oh, you could bring the dog down to the church sometime and we could start off with just like uh, my kids and stuff and we'll kind of get the dog acclimated a little bit. So she sent me a message. And yesterday she brought Pat down here, who's a black lab about this tall, just super cute, super laid back, just an awesome dog. And I brought the kids in and we started off just sitting right here. So I lectured them all the way down here and said, listen, when Pat has his vest on, don't talk to Pat. Don't go up and pet Pat. Don't take Pat a treat. If you walk by him, you just walk by him. You can see him, but you don't stimulate him. You don't give him something to give his attention to. For right now, we're just going to walk past him. So we just all sat here. And Paul was walking him around here and there. And then we started getting up and walking around. And Daniel ran up the aisle one time just out of the blue. And what we're doing is we're helping Pat to ignore the distractions. And I was explaining to the boy sitting here, there's going to be a time when Pat is leading somebody who can't see. And if Pat sees a hot dog over here and he wants that and he goes to that, the person he's taking care of is going to get drugged through people or under a table or whatever, and his job is to protect them, to keep them from getting hit by a car or getting hurt or stepping on something they can't see. That's their job, and it's very important. So... We got to have a little piece in training Pat. And then as it wrapped up, you know, he got his vest off and we got to pet him and play with him a little bit. And uh, that was awesome. But this animal is being trained to focus on what it is that is they are literally born to do. Pat was bred by the organization that um, Dave and Paula got him from to do this job. He's a very calm lab. Very caring, very attentive. He would do things like uh, Caleb had a little cup with some chips. So Pat smelled it, so he puts his face over a little bit, and then right back to Paula, where his attention is supposed to be, which is awesome. So he's doing a great job. And at some point, Paula is going to bring Pat to church. So just in passing, if you see Paula come in with a black lab, and he's got his vest on, let your kids know and know yourself. To He's learning to ignore you when he has his vest on, but we can be helpful in trying to give him space and let him not give him more than he needs to to ignore. So as a church family, we are going to take part a little bit in helping them to train a dog that's going to minister to someone who is uh, visually impaired or visually and hearing impaired. So she'll have Pat till he's about 16 months old or so, and then he'll go and he'll serve someone for life. And that's a pretty cool thing, and we're going to have a piece of that. But you realize... Our lives are just like Pat's. God has a purpose for our life. And we can learn to keep our focus on him. Does Pat enjoy treats? Absolutely. In fact, he gets treats while he's being trained. Will he get to play? Yes. Will he have a loving home? Absolutely. Will there be things that Pat doesn't get to do that maybe your dog does? Yep. But you know what? Pat's life is given to serving someone who needs him. And this world needs you. This world needs for you to be focused enough on your Savior, on the one who has paid you, cares for you, supplies your needs. This world needs you to be focused enough 
that when they need you, you save them from getting hit by a bad decision, falling off a cliff of getting into drug abuse. There are places, very simple places, where God is equipping your life between the birth and death on your grave marker. And he wants to leverage every part of your life to reach people around you that only you can reach. But it's going to take some focus. He doesn't need a group text jumping in the middle of your life. So look at the things that are so important that in an instant they can drag your focus away. And begin to ask yourself, what are the things that are maybe a little bit too big, a little bit too important? What could I not have in my pocket all the time? What is, what is it in my life that I really live for? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you think of? What are you thinking of when you fall asleep at night? When you get stressed out, what's the thing you go to to feel better? This is just being aware. When Pat was, say, six months old, he had a, a lot fewer answers for what he should do than he has now. But all these habits and things he's doing are becoming his life, and they're becoming second nature. One of the things I had never thought about, and uh, Paula actually was kind of, I could see her doing it, and then she explained. For someone who's visually impaired, their service dog needs to be perfectly fine with being totally groped and handled. Because like when they're going to put Pat's vest on, they might sit down and grab him and pull him over and spin him around and sit him down and put his vest on. Now, you and I could look at Pat and say, oh, he's limping a little bit. Maybe one of his pads on his paws is cut up. If you're blind, you don't know that. Unless you hear the change in his gait, you don't know. So a person who has a service dog is going to scan that dog. They are going to touch that dog everywhere to make sure everything is just fine. And before a service dog is given to somebody to take care of them, That organization needs to know that that dog can be handled all over and they're going to have no problem with it because they can't have a dog get angry at its owner because, well, it doesn't like being touched here or there because it's needed. Our lives are the same. He needs to be able to put his hands on different parts of our life without us flipping out, without us getting so stressed that we can't do our job. Does that make sense? We've been talking about, Pat, coming to the church and beginning to get used to this building and this group of people for months. And it just happens that Paula sends me a message yesterday. And today's message is completely about exactly this. So I hope that when you eventually meet Pat or when you see a service dog, you realize that our lives are much the same. He's not necessarily calling you out of your job or your career but he wants you to work in that place in a way that impacts the world he's intended you to impact. It's very simple. Pat's life is not complicated, but it's very, very focused. A couple of the dogs that they've trained have done things like travel the world with their owner. There's uh, one young girl who is visually impaired whose dog has given her the ability to literally travel the entire Europe. It's amazing. Without him, she couldn't do that. So when you think of lives surrounding yours, who are these people whose lives could be so different if you were their pet? If you were the person who was there next to them when they needed to get up? You were the person saying, oh, that's a little, I wouldn't go that way. I wouldn't go this way. Why don't you do this? Giving them things. Sometime when you're on YouTube, search amazing seeing eye dog. Some of the stories out there of people's lives being impacted will absolutely blow you away. I think he wants to use our lives in much the same way. So the question, again, is to plow or not to plow. Is your life going to be focused enough on your Savior? Or are you going to be hands on the plow? Oh, check the cell phone, hands on the plow. Oh, I need a drink of water. And just distracted to where... It would have been better off if you just didn't do the job at all because now it needs to be fixed. And, you know, plowing is a pretty simple thing. Go straight. When you get to the other end, turn around and go straight. When you get to the other end, turn around and go straight. But it takes focus. Let's pray.
Hey, this is Pastor Dave. You know, one thing I'm realizing in all of these series is that it takes focus for anything of true value to happen in our lives. You know, we just have to be aware of what we are distracted by and what we are focused on. Otherwise, um, we're kind of going to get whatever and not what we really want. I encourage you to take a look at what it is you're called to and focus on the only one who can make that happen in your life. Hope you have a blessed week and we'll see you again here soon.